Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so, so much for joining us tonight for an evening with Madeline Miller. My name is Megan, and I'm the Programs and Exhibit Supervisor at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. I'm joined by my colleagues, Jennifer of Algonquin Area Public Library and Christy of Naperville Public Library, who will be leading our discussion with Madeline. Trisha of Champaign Public Library, Jez of Elmhurst Public Library, and Megan of Naperville Public Library will be joining us in chat. Thank you so much to all 30 plus libraries and library communities for joining us in making this night possible. Without you, we wouldn't be here sharing this amazing experience together. If you are interested in purchasing either of Madeline's books, the bookstall has made both The Song of Achilles and Circe readily available. We will put the link in the chat box to direct you. But before we get started, I have a couple of Zoom logistics to run through. The way that we have tonight set up, you do not have the option to turn on your video or to unmute yourself. We highly encourage you to use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen to say hi, or if you're having technology issues. To ask Madeline a question, use the Q&A feature also at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. We do have automatic captions enabled, which you can turn on and off by clicking the CC button. If you are joining us from a mobile device, you can turn them on and off from your Zoom app settings. And in a few moments, we will be releasing a, a poll to give us a better idea of how many people we have joining us tonight. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be shared to our social media channels and only folks on camera will be recorded. Immediately following tonight's program, you will be directed to a short survey. We appreciate your feedback as we use this information to help us with our future program calendar. And now I am going to go ahead and hand it on off to Christy and Jennifer. All right, Megan, I don't know if you can start my video, but it uh, says that the host has stopped it and I can't turn it on right now. Um, all right, Jennifer, do you want to go ahead and then do the introduction? Sure. Right. So we're so excited to have Madeline here with us tonight. Madeline Miller was born in Boston and grew up in New York City and Philadelphia. She attended Brown University, where she earned her BA and MA in Classics. She has taught and tutored Latin, Greek, and Shakespeare to high school students for more than 15 years. She has also studied at the University of Chicago's Committee on Social Thought and in the Dramaturgy Department at the Yale School of Drama, where she focused on the adaptation of classical texts to modern forms. The Song of Achilles, her first novel, was awarded the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction and was a New York Times bestseller. It has been translated into over 25 languages, including Dutch, Mandarin, Japanese, Turkish, Arabic, and Greek. Madeline was also shortlisted for the 2012 Stonewall Writer of the Year, and her essays have appeared in a number of publications, including The Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Latham's Quarterly, and NPR.org. Her second novel, Circe, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and has been widely praised from NPR to People Magazine to The Washington Post. Now I'm going to turn it over to Madeline. She has some uh, uh, something that she wanted to say to all of you tonight. Um, hello, I, I'm just so thrilled to be here and thank you all so much for having me. Um, I wanna say that in particular, it always warms my heart to speak to libraries and to people who support libraries. My mother was a librarian. I grew up in libraries um, and so much of what I learned about writing, I learned from just sitting in the stacks and reading book after book after book. So libraries are my haven, they're my special place. 
thanks to all of you out there who are librarians, who run libraries, and all of you who support libraries, because they are really the heart and soul um, of, of readers and writers, I think. So thank you so much for having me. Um, should I, I should go ahead and start. Is that, does that sound right? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to kick things off today by just doing a very, very short reading. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to write Song of Achilles and Circe. Um, and then I'm excited to hear everyone's questions. So Circe in Greek mythology, I'm going to read from Circe. Um, and in Greek mythology, she is the daughter of the sun god Helios. She's also a witch. And her witchcraft and her divinity are really two separate things. She's born a goddess, but she makes herself into a witch. She is infamous for turning Odysseus's men into pigs in the Odyssey. Um, and the section I'm going to read here is from the middle of the novel after she has already been exiled from her father's halls, sent to the island of Aiaia, where she will later on encounter Odysseus and started turning men into pigs. So here we go. He asked me once, why pigs? We were seated before my hearth in our usual chairs. He liked the one draped in cowhide with silver inlaid in its carvings. Sometimes he would rub the scrolling absently beneath his thumb. Why not? I said. He gave me a bare smile. I mean it, I would like to know. I knew he meant it. He was not a pious man, but the seeking out of things hidden, this was his highest worship. There were answers in me. I felt them buried deep as last year's bulbs growing fat. Their roots tangled with those moments I had spent against the wall when my lions were gone and my spell shut up inside me. After I changed a crew, I would watch them scrabbling and crying in the sty, falling over each other, stupid with their horror. They hated it all, their newly voluptuous flesh, their delicate split trotters, their swollen bellies dragging in the earth's muck. It was a humiliation, a debasement. They were sick with longing for their hands, those appendages men use to mitigate the world. Come, I would say to them, it's not that bad. You should appreciate a pig's advantages. Mud slick and swift, they're hard to catch. Low to the ground, they cannot easily be knocked over. They are not like dogs. They do not need your love. They can thrive anywhere, on anything, scraps and trash. They look witless and dull, which lulls their enemies. But they are clever. They will remember your face. They never listened. The truth is, men make terrible pigs. So um, in terms of how I fell in love with these stories, it actually goes all the way back, speaking of my librarian mother, uh, to the fact that she used to read me pieces of the Iliad and the Odyssey as bedtime stories, starting when I was around five and six years old. And I actually have a memory of her reading the first line of the Iliad, sing goddess of the destructive rage of Achilles, and just being immediately hooked. Now, I feel like before I go on, I have to say that I also really liked, you know, Goodnight Moon and Winnie the Pooh, like all those normal things. But there was something about these stories that felt both incredibly exciting and also incredibly real. And I think that what I was responding to is something that I still respond to now, which is that even though there are gods and monsters and all these fantastical prophecies, these are really very powerful stories about human emotion and human lives. You know, they're stories about parents and children. They're stories about pride and folly, courage, about making mistakes and trying to make up for those mistakes, um, about husbands and wives, brothers and sisters. I mean, the, these are, you know, really timeless human emotions, grief, pain, love, despair. And there was something in that that felt incredibly real, even with all this fantasy. So as soon as I could read for myself, I found every version of the myths that I could find and I, I dove into those. Um, I was fortunate that I was able to go to a high school that offered Latin. I had a wonderful Latin teacher who saw that I was completely obsessed with these stories. And he actually offered to teach me Greek. And I said, yes, please sign me up. Um, and so he and I 
studied for a while and then started reading the Iliad together. And I thought that I had loved these stories before, but getting to read the Iliad, that same line that my mom had read to me in English in the original Greek was absolutely electrifying. So I knew that heading off to college, I wanted to continue studying these things. And, you know, I love the history aspect, but what I always loved first and foremost was the poetry, the beauty of the language, um, and, and the way these myths were told by different authors, in particular by different epic authors. So um, I studied all these things in college. And one thing that, you know, as I continued to go deeper into them, I couldn't help but notice is that, you know, as wonderful as they were, I also found parts of them incredibly frustrating, um, in particular, the women of the myths. Now, there are a few kind of big villains of the stories, women like Clytemnestra um, or Medea, women who kind of cause destruction wherever they go. But for the most part, most of the women in these stories are barely even names. You know, they're just this person's mother or this person's daughter or this person's wife. They're defined by their relationship to a man. If their story is really exciting, they might get to die to motivate the male hero. But they don't really get the same level of agency or focus or time, particularly in the epic poetry. And I was really frustrated by that. And going all the way back to eighth grade in particular, um, I remember coming across, you know, as I was reading all these myths, I had come across this character of Circe, the witch who turned men into pigs. And I thought, well, that sounds amazing. Um, I definitely want to learn more about that. And so I was really excited when I found out that my eighth grade class, we were all going to read the Odyssey. And I thought, well, this is great. I'm going to get to read in an English translation all about Circe. So um, if any of you know the Odyssey, and I just want to pause, I know some of you in the audience have read the book, have read either one of the books and some of you haven't. Um, one of the things that's really important to me in writing these books is that no one has to know any Greek mythology going into it. I definitely did not want anyone to feel like they had to do homework before they could read these books. Um, that was something that was really significant to me. If you know classics already, there are some goodies in there. If you don't, this can be an introduction. Um, so, you know, that was really, an important piece for me. But the sort of context of the Circe episode in the Odyssey goes like this. So Odysseus has, of course, left Greece with all the other Greek kings and princes and captains, and they have all sailed to Troy to besiege the city and try to get back Helen, often called Helen of Troy, but actually she was married to, to the king of, of Sparta first. Um, and they camp out just outside the walls of Troy, trying to get Helen back. And for 10 years, they can't take the city. Finally, in the last year of the war, Odysseus, wily Odysseus, clever Odysseus, Odysseus of many schemes, comes up with this plan to build a giant wooden horse, stuff it full of soldiers, and then sail the rest of the fleet just out of sight as if they've left the horse as a gift for the Trojans. The Trojans fall for it. They pull the Trojan horse inside the city. They have a huge party, hooray, 10 years, the Greeks are gone. Then they all go to sleep. As soon as they're asleep, the Greeks open up the belly of the horse. They come out and they sack the city. Sacks of cities are awful and brutal and horrifying things. In the ancient world, this would have meant that all the men would have been killed and the women and children enslaved. The Greeks took absolutely everything they could find and they stuffed their holds full of treasure and captives. And as victors, they sail back to Greece with Odysseus with them, who is not only a victor, but the hero of the war, dubbed best of the Greeks. Now, two years later, most of the other Greeks have made it home, but not Odysseus. He's still out there lost on the waves. And in that time, from leaving Troy as a conqueror to two years later, he has lost 11 of his 12 ships. These are men who survived the 10 years of war and they die on the way home. And they die in the most brutal and horrifying ways you can imagine, torn apart by the Cyclops, um, devoured by cannibals, just death after death after death. He has one ship left. He's demoralized, he's grieving, his men are completely ground down 
and then they land on this lush and beautiful island. And Odysseus says to his men, let's go, you know, explore, see who's, who might be here. Maybe we can get some help from them, uh, or maybe we could just steal from them. One of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind, Odysseus has uh, done very well generationally that over the generations, we've come to really like Odysseus. The ancients were much more suspicious of him. And in the Odyssey, he's really just a glorified pirate. Um, he's constantly taking things that don't belong to him and looting um, wherever he goes. So it's a little unclear what his intentions are towards whoever these inhabitants are. But what he does as he goes exploring is he sees a little smoke drifting above the trees. He realizes someone lives here and he sends a contingent of his men to go find out who this person is. So the men go and they find this beautiful and palatial home. And outside in the garden, there are these tame lions and wolves just kind of hanging out, which would have really disturbed me. But they continue up to the door and they knock on the door and they're greeted by this beautiful goddess who says, you know, welcome, welcome, come in. Let me give you food, let me give you wine. It turns out she has drugged the wine and after they consume it, she casts a magical spell, turns them into pigs and drives them out to her sty. Now, one of the men has held back, possibly tipped off by the lions and wolves. And he goes running down to tell Odysseus, there's a witch and she's turned men into pigs. And Odysseus says, okay, well, I have to go confront her. And so he goes to confront the witch. And on the way to confront Circe, he's stopped by the Greek god Hermes, the great god of travelers, the trickster god, and also an ancestor of Odysseus's. They kind of had the same sneaky blood. Um, and what he says to Odysseus is this witch is actually quite frightening and powerful. So I'm gonna give you these magical herbs that will make you immune to her spells. So armed with these herbs, Odysseus goes to confront Circe. And this was the moment that as a 13 year old in my eighth grade English class, I was on the edge of my seat for, I thought, you know, finally we're gonna get a really interesting and complicated woman. Um, you know, there's gonna be a battle of wits. He's obviously very complicated. Finally, she can match him. You know, this is gonna be a great scene. But what actually happens in the Odyssey is that uh, she gives him the drugged wine. He consumes it. She tries to turn him into a pig. It doesn't work. And then he pulls his sword on her and threatens her. And she screams, falls to her knees, begs for mercy, and invites him into her bed in basically one speech. And I just remember this feeling of total disappointment. I thought, that's it? That's all she gets? He's not going to even ask her why she's turning men into pigs? You know, and of course, I understood this is his hero's journey. She's the obstacle. He has to overcome her, all of that. But, you know, the phallic sword did not escape my notice, even as an eighth grader. My eighth grade teacher was really into phallic symbols. And I thought, you know, can't we just keep the camera on this character a little longer? Does the woman have to be literally put on her knees at Odysseus's feet? And I didn't know at the time that that reaction, that passionate and angry reaction that my very offended 13 year old self had would lead to this novel. But I do think that that was the beginning. Um, was this desire to see more and to see her story centered in a way that it wasn't being centered. Now, I talked about how I went on to study these things. And so luckily I returned to this story many more times as an older student. And I began to see something different in it as an older student. As I was thinking about Circe, what I, I began to think about was how unfairly treated I felt she was in later versions of her story that oftentimes Circe actually gets remembered as just a straight up villain. She gets put in that same category with Clytemnestra and Medea. You know, she's the man hater. She's the evil witch. She's gonna lure you in like a spider, luring in flies. You know, all this sort of like real villainy accrues around her. Um, in medieval and Renaissance times, they would publish these lovely little pamphlets about how to control your wife and the, you know, the picture that always went along with what happens if you don't with Circe. You know, this is what happens when you let women get power, they'll turn you right into a pig. And I thought, well, that's really interesting that that is sort of became the story of Circe because in the Odyssey, she's a much more positive character. So after that moment where she and Odysseus come to an understanding, they do in fact become lovers. She looks at him and she says, you and your men are exhausted stay on my island and heal as long as you need to. 
and he takes her up on it. She turns his men back from pigs into men. Um, and as a little bonus, she makes them younger and stronger than they were before. And she hosts them in high divine style for the next year. And Odysseus up to this point has been constantly agitating to get home. Every place they go, Odysseus wants to go, go, go. He wants to get back to see his wife, Penelope, who he loves in Ithaca. He wants to see his son who was an infant when he left and at this point is 12. And by the time he actually gets home will be 20 or older. And so, you know, he's constantly grieving for his family, for his parents. Um, wanting to get home. And every place he goes, he's, he's saying, I want to leave, I want to leave, except for Circe's Island. At the end of the year, his men actually have to come to him and say, you know, it's time to go. Are we going to remember Ithaca? Are we going to get going? And Odysseus says, yes, you're right. It is time to go. And he goes to Circe and he says, I'm ready to go. And she says, great, here's what you need to know. The next thing you have to do is you have to get advice from this dead prophet. So you have to call him out of the underworld and you have to do this ritual. Don't worry, I'll give you the animals. And you have to dig this pit. Don't worry, I'll give you the dimensions. And she starts sort of unloading this incredibly specific knowledge that you could basically only get from a witch with a necromancer brother, which is what Circe is. Um, and aside from giving him all that knowledge, she also gives him advice about how to get past the monsters ahead, how to get past the sirens uh, with their beautiful voices that make people go mad when they hear them. She's the one who says, put beeswax in your men's ears. And so all of that was really fascinating to me. I thought, gosh, Circe is not only not a villain, she is one of the most helpful characters that he encounters. And that was a real sort of shift for me as I was thinking about Circe. Now, none of this leads to me actually writing <laughs> about, about these things from, a, from I, I won't say creative because I think academic writing actually is very creative, but from a, from a fiction standpoint, from a novel standpoint. So, um, but at some point, and, and I can talk about this a little bit more later, I had this sort of epiphany that I could write back to these stories. Because up to this point, I had studied classics over here. And then over here, completely separately, I wanted to be a writer. And I had been reading contemporary fiction. I had been I wrote a terrible novel in college, which I inflicted on my poor roommate. Um, it will never see the light of day, but it was really helpful for me to write that story because I felt like it was really, it kind of taught me how to write a novel. It was kind of, Ann Patchett talks about um, writing a novel, you have to kind of turn on the pipes and let the sludge come out. So that was my sludge novel. And I, but it was all set in the contemporary world. There was no sort of the closest I got was one of the characters was a Latin teacher. That was as close as I got to classics. And then at some point I directed a production of Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida, which is Shakespeare's version of the Iliad. And it was, it was in the process of directing that play that allowed me to realize how exciting it was to get to put your hands in the story and, and shape it yourself. Because as I was directing Troilus and Cressida, which has all these characters, you know, Odysseus is in it by his Roman name, Ulysses, Cassandra, Helen, Ajax, Achilles, you know, all these big names that I had spent all this time studying. And I was getting to talk to the actors about their character arcs and, you know, how they should present themselves and what their motivations were. And it was so exciting to realize that I could interact with the material, not just from an academic standpoint, but I could make emotional arguments about the material. And so that kind of launched me into realizing, you know, these passionate things that I want to say about Circe, also the passionate things I wanted to say about Achilles and Patroclus, um, I felt like really fit better in a novel. You know, the, the, the argument I wanted to make about them was, was an emotional argument. And then the question was, well, how do I do that? How do I write back to these stories? Because my first feeling when I had that thought of, I wanna write a novel about this was, you know, this is blasphemy. <laughs> there was this part of me that felt like, oh my gosh, how can I do this? I'm, I'm doing some, you know, I'm treading on sacred ground. The classics police are gonna to come to my house and take me away. You know, how, how can I dare to write back to these stories? Now, when I look back on that, very young person who was having that feeling, I have to kind of laugh because of course these stories have been told and retold and retold since the very beginning. You know, the Iliad and the Odyssey themselves really were originally, they came out of oral tradition. 
they were written down later, but they were originally these living poems that were performed by different bards, you know, who would shape the version of the story they were telling based on audience interaction. These were stories that were passed down from parent to child, from grandparent to grandchild, and they were constantly evolving. And as soon as the Iliad and the Odyssey existed in a fairly set form, then they evolved further. You know, then you have Aeschylus and Euripides writing back to them. And then, you know, in later times you have Virgil and Ovid and then, you know, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Margaret Atwood, Derek Walcott. So there's this like unbroken line of retellings of these stories. There is no such thing as a definitive myth. So that's what I wish I could have told myself back then. But back then I was very stressed out about it. <laughs> and I didn't wanna tell anybody that I was starting to do this. Um, but part of what I really wanted to do, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the focus on Circe just to kind of stay a little more organized, but please feel free in the questions to ask me all about Song of Achilles, um, cause I can definitely talk about that just as much. But what I wanted to do in the case of, of both novels was really dig into the psychology of these characters. That that's what I was trying to do is to kind of find my way into these stories using psychology. And I think that, you know, mythology, in these stories, the stories about Achilles, about Circe, about Odysseus, I think that we have lots of clues about um, psychology of the characters, but at no point in mythology are we getting like the Hamlet soliloquy. You know, we're not getting the psychological deep dive. That's just not how myth works. Um, and so it was really exciting to try to imagine my way into these characters. And of course, one of my first questions about Circe is why is Circe turning men into pigs? You know, here is Odysseus, the most curious man in ancient literature, and he doesn't ask her. That seemed shocking to me. And so I began to think, well, you know, how have other people answered this question? A lot of people answered it for a long time. It's in like, well, because you know how women are, that's they'll just turn you into a pig if they get any power. That's just what they're like, as opposed to, you know, something much more interesting. I mean, that's first of all sexist, but second of all boring. I think people do things for reasons. And turning someone into a pig, I began to think is actually a pretty extreme thing to do. What might cause someone to start doing something so extreme? And, you know, probably it would be something pretty extreme. And then on top of that, how did Circe get that kind of power? Because witchcraft is really very different, as I said, from divinity. Witchcraft is something that you do. It's something that you have to learn. It's really a craft. So, you know, in the ancient world, witchcraft is not the Shazam type of power. You don't snap your fingers and make it happen like you do with divine power you know, you have to instead, it comes from harvesting the right herbs, mixing the potions, saying the right words, trial and error, dedication, passionate study, you know, it's an art. And so another piece of the puzzle as I was thinking about Circe is, you know, this is an artist. This is a woman who has a vocation, who's dedicated to her craft. And her craft in this case happens to be witchcraft, but you know, it could it could be anything. But the point is, is that she has devoted her life to transforming the world through this particular art. Um, I also thought a lot about sort of trying to tease out the hints that existed in the ancient material. So one of the descriptions of Circe in the Odyssey is um, Homer calls her the dread goddess who speaks like a human. And that really tantalized me. It's actually just one word in the Greek, speaking like a human. I thought, well, what does that mean to speak like a human? So then of course I start thinking, well, what does it mean to speak like a God? And I thought about all the Greek myths where gods address humans and humans are just shaking. You know, if to hear the voice of a God is to hear thunderbolts and earthquakes. And when a God talks to you in Greek mythology, your hair stands on end and your blood runs cold and you fall to your knees. And, you know, maybe you're completely rendered speechless. And if it's Zeus who's appearing to you and he hasn't veiled his power from you, you might actually just incinerate. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. You know, Circe is born among beings like that who can incinerate with their voices, but she speaks like one of us. So what, what does that mean? And I thought, well, you know, the ancient Greek gods value power 
above all. If we were really gonna get diagnostic about it, we would call most of the ancient Greek gods sociopathic narcissists. I mean, they are completely selfish, obsessed with their own desires. They're capricious, they're cruel, they're vengeful, they hold grudges. Um, they just live in this world of total, uh, you know, isolation and, and privilege and power. Now, Circe is kind of at the edges of that. She is a nymph. And one thing about the ancient Greek gods is that they are incredibly hierarchical. And so, you know, up here you have the big names, Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Athena, Helios, Circe's father. And then you have sort of down on through the ranks, you have the river gods and the winds and the graces, and then down at the very, very bottom are the nymphs. They're so weak, they're almost human. And that's where Circe is. And so that was also interesting to me is that even though she's a goddess, which sounds pretty great, she's at the very, very bottom of the divine hierarchy. And then she has this weird thing where she speaks like us in this weak, strange voice. And so I thought, well, this is really interesting. You know, she would be an outcast. She would be a person who's kind of straddling worlds. You know, she one foot is in the world of the gods, but there's this other piece of her that somehow belongs to or yearns for the human world. And so that's all me, you know, spinning with my novelist brain. And that's what I really love is those moments where kind of the academic side doing a deep dive into, you know, how Circe is presented in the ancient material gives me this really thrilling sort of doorway into kind of my creative imagination. Um, you know, letting things kind of germinate and grow in unexpected ways. So all of, if any of you have read Circe, you'll know that that sort of um, division in Circe between the mortal and the human world, uh, sorry, the, the mortal and immortal worlds ends up forming, you know, a huge backbone of a lot of the story. And it all came from one word in the ancient Greek. So I love doing that. I love digging into that. And at the same time that I'm using, you know, the ancient materials to draw out psychology and to let myself be inspired by, there are also things I'm pushing back against. Um, and one of the things that I am pushing back against is sort of this idea of how the ancients present these side characters, particularly women. Now, you know, the male heroic tradition, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, these are stories that were considered, you know, the most exciting and most important epics, you know, the most important pieces of literature, and they were traditionally male, and they were about traditionally male things. They were about war, vengeance, adventuring, inheritance, you know, all these things that are traditionally male. There are some amazing female characters in, in the ancient epics, don't get me wrong. Achilles' mother is really interesting. Um, Andromache, Hector's wife in the Iliad is really interesting. Of course, Odysseus' wife, Penelope. You know, there are many wonderful characters, but the focus is always on the men and the male characters. And so I thought, well, you know, Circe's story is kind of hidden under this male heroic tradition. You know, she is being treated as kind of the object here. But then I realized something else about the Circe episode in the Odyssey, which is that it's actually being narrated not by the poet of the Odyssey, which most of the Odyssey is, but by Odysseus himself, that he retells a chunk of his journey to some people that he's trying to impress. And as soon as I realized that, I really felt like I was being invited into this story so much. I thought, well, now I don't have to believe anything he says. You know, Odysseus is the great liar of ancient literature. He lies his way across the Mediterranean. He lies when he doesn't even have to. And once I realized that the Circe episode, as he tells it, um, is something that he's doing to impress these people, I thought, well, of course, you know, oh, there was this terrifying witch and she totally got the jump on my men, but because the gods love me, I had help and I tamed her and then she threw herself at me and she was super hot. I mean, that's the story that Odysseus basically tells to these people. And every time he talks about how powerful and how beautiful Circe is, what he's really saying is, you know, look how great I am. And I thought, well, this means that, you know, all bets are off. I can do anything with this story. I can push back. My Circe doesn't have to kneel in that moment. 
um, if I don't want her to, because that, that can be part of how Odysseus is telling the story to make himself look good. So that was really a very freeing moment for me, realizing that, you know, she's kind of been layered under <laughs> two, two layers, not just the male heroic tradition, but then Odysseus's own self-aggrandizement, you know, and Odysseus has had 3000 years to tell his version of the story. So it felt only fair to give Circe the chance to tell hers. And as I was thinking about her, I wanted to really make her the center of her own epic story. You know, I wanted to take her from object, from obstacle, from help meet, all the roles she plays with Odysseus and instead make her subject of the story. She's the one with the agency. And so part of that was really just how I conceived of the whole story. You know, she's just a cameo in the Odyssey. She's there for two plus books of the Odyssey, that's it. So I made sure very deliberately that Odysseus is only in two plus chapters of the novel because I thought I want him to occupy the same space in her life that she occupies in his, i.e. not very much. You know, he comes through and then he's gone again and her life, you know, leading up to him and afterwards is just as significant, if not more so than the time she spends with him. So that was, I felt like really important is to really invest in the myths around her, um, not just in the Odysseus part of the story. Now, you know, I was very fortunate because Circe was a character who has a lot of other really interesting mythological associations. As I said, she's the daughter of the sun god Helios, which makes her related to all the major Titans, basically all the gods. <laughs> so, you know, she has lots of interesting gods to associate with. She's also the aunt of the Minotaur in mythology. She's the aunt of Medea, the other great ancient witch. Um, so, you know, she has a lot of these associations. So it was really fun to get to find those myths and sort of figure out how was I gonna work those in organically? Um, because I wanted it to feel very organic. I mean, one of the things, one of my rules for myself, um, and there are no rules when you're adapting a novel. I mean, the truth is, is that you can do it any way you want. It just, you have to sort of be true to your own sensibility. So my particular sensibility, the way I like to write back is I want it to feel real. Even though I'm writing about six headed monsters, um, I want it to feel like there is a reality to the world. And so, you know, if, in one chapter, she was meeting Pegasus. And then the next chapter, she met Hercules. And then after that, she was meeting Percy. You know, if I sort of pulled on all the greatest hits of Greek mythology, that didn't feel realistic to me. I wanted every sort of adventure that she had to be related to a myth that she was naturally already interacting with kind of in the ancient sources. So I focused on the Minotaur, I focused on Medea, um, and I focused on Odysseus, I focused on uh, Helios and sort of what was going on with that and her interactions with all those people. Um, now I'm going to talk just very briefly about Song of Achilles sort of as a contrast to the way I looked at Circe because in some sense Circe and Song of Achilles are very similar and in another way I was actually approaching them in completely um, opposite ways. So with Song of Achilles I talked about how with Circe I was taking a woman's life which is traditionally not considered important enough for an epic story and putting it at the center of an epic story with gods and monsters. Um, I allowed Circe to make horrific mistakes just like Odysseus and Achilles have been making for 3000 years. And I allowed her to sort of have the scope that they have had. Um, and that was really significant to me because, you know, women have been oftentimes kept out of epic. And so by putting her in epic, it was this way to kind of push back. And also I wanted to take things that were traditionally associated with women in the ancient world and really give them their epic space. Um, so things like craft work, gardening, uh, parenting and caregiving, you know, that was one of the sections I loved writing with Cersei is her being a parent and, and a couple birth scenes as well, because birth and parenting are by definition, I think, incredibly epic. <laughs> and so they should be part of an epic story. So I really enjoy doing that. But with Song of Achilles, I was working with the myth of Achilles, the great hero of the Greeks, the original best of the Greeks um, before you know, he dies and then Odysseus takes over. Sorry, that's a huge spoiler, but you know, it is a 3000 year old myth. Um, and so Achilles and, and his story and his, and his beloved Patroclus are already given the epic treatment. I mean, they are the subject 
of the Iliad, particularly Achilles, but you know, Patroclus as kind of satellite to him. And Patroclus is, here comes another spoiler, I'm sorry. Patroclus's death in the Iliad is the hinge. I mean, it's the turning point that the whole plot of the Iliad you know, works on. So they are integral to the epic. And instead of sort of going for an epic story with them, instead of sending, setting them at the center of this huge broad stage as I did with Circe, I actually wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to tell this epic story from an incredibly intimate perspective. And so as I was writing Song of Achilles, instead of reaching for the world of epic as my inspiration, I was reaching to the world of ancient lyric poetry. Um, and now lyric poetry in the ancient world is the poetry of love. It's the poetry of friendship. It's the poetry of dinner parties. It's the poetry of small, beautiful things of daily life. And some of our great lyric poets from the ancient world are Sappho, Catullus. You know, these were the kind of love poets that I was steeping myself in as I was thinking about Song of Achilles. So as I wanted to kind of blow up the perspective on Circe, I wanted to take Achilles and Patroclus off their epic pedestals and bring them into the world of lyric poetry and sort of really see them as people and set this love story instead at the center um, of the epic world. Now I am seeing so many incredible questions <laughs> coming up in the chat. So I am gonna, there's so much more I could say, but I wanna pause because I wanna be able to answer um, as many of these questions as I can. So I think we have some wonderful people who are going to help moderate some of these questions. Um, so I will start taking them. Hi, Madeline. Yes, thank you. Um, you've actually answered a lot of the questions um, <laughs> that uh, prior to the start of this. Um, so that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, one question that has been asked by a lot of people, well, a couple questions. One, uh, what is your favorite myth? Or if you don't have a favorite, what is another favorite myth of yours and why? And then second, do you have a particular translation of Homer that you prefer? Those are such great questions. So, um, I mean, this is a little bit of a cop-out answer, but obviously Circe and, it, and <laughs> the myth of Circe and the myth of Patroclus are, are two of my absolute favorites. Um, the Iliad in general, you know, you're not supposed to have favorites between the Iliad and the Odyssey, but I've always kind of been drawn to the Iliad a, a little bit more, partially because I, I often find Odysseus so frustrating. Um, other than that, outside of that, I mean, the, the myth of Cassandra, I just find, so heart-wrenching um you know the woman who is always trying to speak up and tell the truth and no one will listen to her is just I mean that is one that just talks right across the millennia um but there are so many there are so many that I love and it's interesting that at different moments kind of different myths resonate more with me um the myth of Persephone is one that has always resonated with me and I'll it's, I'm actually working a little bit on that now. So I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, on to translations. Uh, Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey is absolutely incredible. So smart, totally accessible. Um, her foreword is amazing. Her translator's note at the beginning where she kind of talks about the context of the Odyssey and how she approaches it. You know, one of the things about translation that I think I used to forget a lot is that translations are really interpretations. That literally with every word, a translator is making a choice and leading you as you know, the reader in one direction or another in terms of how they're interacting with the material. And a lot of times translators don't necessarily admit that. And so I, I really love that Emily Wilson is very upfront about what she's doing. And so, as I said, so smart, she's a professor at Penn. And um, I could tell that it was also really like just an incredible translation from an excitement point of view, because when I was reading it, I was like, oh gosh, I hope Odysseus is gonna make it. And then I was like, uh, actually, I know how this story ends, but <laughs> you know, that's a sign that she had really gotten me. And um, I was really also struck by how much she was kind of pushing back at the way certain narratives have 
developed over time around the Odyssey. Um, there is a group of women that Odysseus orders killed at the end of the Odyssey. They are women that are enslaved women who he accuses of being disloyal to him for sleeping with the suitors, the men who have been besieging his house. Now, oftentimes in translation, it has become sort of a, like a tradition in English translations to call them the maids. Um, but maids really means something very different to us in the modern world. The word in Greek is female slave. And so, you know, Emily Wilson is kind of going back to that and, and she uses the word, you know, female slave. And I, I feel like that really changes how we interpret Odysseus's actions at that moment. You know, these are not women who have the consent to refuse, you know, they don't have the ability to refuse these men. And so, you know, little things like that you know, just how you shade one word or another make a huge difference. So anyway, she's awesome. She's working on the Iliad right now, but her Iliad is not finished yet. Um, so for the Iliad, I don't have one particular front runner, uh, but what I would recommend for the Iliad is actually an audiobook because the Iliad is full of name after name after name, like book two, the end of book two is literally the catalog of ships where they're like, and this guy had 12 ships and he came from here and this guy had, and you know, this would have been really exciting and powerful in the ancient world because it would have been like, and then came so-and-so from Cincinnati and then came so-and-so from, you know, Philly. And like, so for an ancient audience that would have been really exciting that catalog, but for us, it doesn't really hit the same way. And I think, you know, here Hearing it in audiobook allows that to go by <laughs> so that it doesn't kind of, you know, you don't feel like, do I need to be remembering these names? Do I need to be highlighting these names? It just, you know, it should go by. It should go by you. And of course, then you're experiencing it as the ancients would have experienced it originally. You know, as I said, these were pieces that were performed. They were sung to music before an audience. So whatever you do with the Iliad, and there are a couple of great translations. I think there's even a Derek Jacobi audiobook out there. So, you know, listen to a couple samples and see whose voice you like the best, but go for an audiobook. Thank you. Jennifer has the next question for you. So Madeline, many of our patrons attending tonight are aspiring writers and they wanted to know about your writing process. What does your pre-writing planning process look like? And also how do you deal with writer's block and burnout? That's such a good question. Um, so I, I'm not a huge, I don't do a big outline beforehand. Um, most of my work, and you know, one of the things I just wanna say is that every writer has to find their own way. And I think it can be really helpful to hear from a lot of different writers about what their, their processes are. And it's all valid. As long as it works for you, it's great. And so I know that there are some people for whom you know, really detailed outlines are really important. But for me, I don't do it that way. I kind of know what the end point is of the novel. And then I have to wander around to find the beginning. <laughs> and then once I have the beginning and the end, I feel like now I can shoot the arrow. You know, now I can, now I can aim from here to there. Um, I leave a lot of space for myself along the way. You know, I knew with Cersei that there were certain kind of portals that I was gonna go through. Um, I knew she was gonna go to Crete and there was gonna be the Minotaur, as I mentioned. I knew she was gonna meet Medea. Of course, I knew the Odysseus section. I knew she was gonna have a child. Um, so I had kind of these, you know, points along the way, but, other than that, I left it very organic because for me, in some sense, what's most significant is the character's emotional journey. And so I really have to write in order. I can't write out of order because I don't know who Cersei is in chapter 18 until I've written chapter 17. So I'm constantly sort of tracing that, that arc. Um, I, knew that, uh, I knew that Daedalus, the master craftsman of the ancient world who builds the labyrinth that contains the Minotaur. I knew that he was gonna show up in the Crete section, but I thought he was gonna have a very small role. And then the more Daedalus scenes I wrote, the more Daedalus scenes I wanted to write. <laughs> and I kept sort of wanting him to be a larger character. And so I let that happen, even though it was very surprising to me. Um, and as it turned out, I think he and Cersei really had a lot to talk about. You know, she's the goddess who is almost human and he's the human who's almost like a god, that his powers of invention make him almost a divinity. And, you know, they are right next to each other. And I think that also he um, is the first fellow artist 
that that she meets. I mean, he's he's an artist with invention, with technology instead of with witchcraft. But you know, those two things also are very close to each other. So he became a very significant character in her journey. Um, so I always want to leave room for things like that. I it takes me five for both of these novels. It took me five years to find the character's voice, and for those five years, it was just me writing and throwing away and writing and throwing away, and that was sort of me trying. I talked about trying to find the beginning, um, and with Song of Achilles, that was really agonizing for me. <laughs> you know, I kept thinking every time I would write something and it wasn't right, I would have this like, oh, I can't do it. I'm not a writer. I'm not a real writer. You know, this is a sign of my failure. And by the time I got to Circe, I thought, no, this is just part of the process. And so if there are any writers out there who are struggling, all those wrong paths, all those, you know, so-called failures are actually just stepping stones to, to getting you to the final version of the story. And you kind of have to go down those wrong paths. And I think sometimes um, early writers get kind of tricked by the idea of word count or page count, you know, this idea of I have to write 2000 words a day or I have to write X number, you know, that, that it's a linear progress, but it is not linear at all. I mean, sometimes the best thing you can do is throw out 2000 words. And that is actually better progress <laughs> than, you know, than writing ahead. So I would just encourage any, any writers out there to um, don't give up in those moments. You know, it's just, it's just part of the process. And if you get really stuck, I sort of have two things that always help me. Um, one is I go for a walk. It's amazing how moving your body helps you move your mind or just look at nature if you can't go for a walk. You know, looking out at a tree, I, I think they've even done studies that like that helps reactivate <laughs> your brain. So, you know, getting out in nature, going for a walk. And then the other thing is read something that you love. You know, read some poetry, read a really wonderful book and just let it kind of inspire you. Um, that always really helps me. In particular, I read a lot of poetry. I find poetry, you know, is doing all the same things that novels do, but incredibly compressed. In poetry, every word is load bearing. And so I love that as, as inspiration to remind myself to, <laughs> to try to make as many words load bearing as possible. Thank you. Uh, Christy has our next question. Uh, yes, a lot of people wanted to know, what are you working on now? What's your next book? Yes. Um, so I mentioned Persephone. Before Persephone, I was working on an adaptation of The Tempest. Um, after that whole Troilus and Cressida thing, I fell in love with Shakespeare. I began directing Shakespeare and, you know, I went down a whole, a whole path with theater. <laughs> and so The Tempest has been in my mind a long time because it is, it's a play I really enjoy, but I don't like directing it. And so I think it's been kind of agitating at me to, to write for a while. So I was all set to write that. I, I've been working on it a lot. I have, you know, hundreds of junk pages of it. Um, but all of a sudden, Penel uh, Persephone, not Penelope, Persephone, who has been kind of with me. I mean, I think she might have been, you know, the very first Greek myth I heard is, is the myth of Persephone. Um, even before my mom read to me, you know, from the Iliad and the Odyssey, I think we, Persephone is one of the first myths. So she's been sitting with me a long time and she kind of, all of a sudden something about her clicked and I started working on it. And I was like, oh, I'll just write a Persephone short story. Oh no, this is a novel. Um, and so Persephone and, she's such a fascinating figure to work with because I feel like even more than any myth, she is a kaleidoscope, you know, that if you just turn it this much, it's a completely different picture. There's so many different ways to look at her. And I think what happened is that I finally figured out my particular lens on her. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing a deep dive in, into her right now and working on that novel, but the Tempest is not gone. It is just to the side. Thank you. I think we're going to turn it over to the chat questions at this point. So uh, the panelists who are looking at that can take over. So I, I, I think, I, I think, I think, I think, oh. 
So I think that um, we're running out of time. So we're gonna ask uh, one more question for you okay. tonight, Madeline. And um, so a lot of our uh, readers and viewers tonight wanted to know what are some of your must reads? Mm. Is there an author that they should totally read when you're stuck on a remote island? Who would you recommend? Mm. And then also, did you have a book that you read that inspired you to wanna be a writer or that changed your life? Oh gosh. Um, so many books have changed my life. Uh, I love The Buddha in the Attic. That's one of my favorite books of all time, Julie Otsuka. Um, she has a new book coming out called The Swimmer, uh, which I have not read yet, but I just ordered it from my local indie. So it's coming. Um, it's coming to me, but it just came out. But The Buddha in the Attic is absolutely incredible. I mean, speaking of sort of where novels and poetry meet, it is such a slim volume. It is so incredibly powerful. Everyone read it. I mean, just, it's just... It's, she uses the first person plural to talk about um, sort of these kind of mail order brides that came over from Japan to America and their experience kind of leading into, you know, the internment camps. It is absolutely, um, it's, I, I can't, it makes me speechless even just, <laughs> just talking about it. I love it so much. Um, so that's one of my favorites. Uh, I recently I loved Matrix by Lauren Groff. Uh, I, sh I guess it should it should be called Matrix because it's it's not it's actually about like a mother um, or sort of a mother superior type figure. Um, I knew significant authors that were really significant to me were um, I loved Margaret Atwood, uh, Isabella Allende, Amy Tan. I just reread The Joy Luck Club. Oh my gosh, that book like blew off the top of my head when I was in high school, and it still does. Um, I loved Isabel Allende and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Those were authors that were really so thrilling to me. And, you know, the first time I read House of the Spirits, again, it was just, it was a complete revelation for me um, in terms of how you could talk about injustice, how you could work with fantasy, fantastical elements, you know, in a story. Um, that is so grounded in incredibly gritty reality. I mean, you know, I didn't know that that was gonna, <laughs> that those types of ideas would help me later, but those were writers that were that were all really significant to me. Um, whenever my brain feels really mushy, I love reading the essays of James Baldwin. He is the, he is the clearest thinker. He's just like, like every thought is just like this, clarity like diamond clarity and so I feel like you know it's just it's amazing to read that it reminds me like okay stop being mushy <laughs> you know it, it's it's inspiring um so I mean just so many so many more uh but I'll stop there <laughs> so I know one thing that some of our patrons here tonight, just really quickly before we turn it over to Megan for our thank you. Did you did you have any idea that Circe or the Song of Achilles would hit cult-like levels on social media um, and, and have the following that they have today? Absolutely not. I mean, I really thought that like the only people that would read Song of Achilles were, you know, going to be blood related to me. <laughs> And I, I, you know, the fact that it started to go out in the world was incredibly meaningful to me. I mean, it just, you know, these stories have lived with me for so long and it is the greatest privilege that they are resonating with, with readers. And I'm just, I'm completely flabbergasted and so grateful. I mean, it is like, I feel like I've been struck by the absolute best kind of lightning there is. So thank you. Thank you to all the readers out there. I am so grateful. Man, what a what a way to end! <laughs> it's I couldn't have planned that better. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. I feel like we could, you know, talk for forever. But thank you so much, Madeline, for joining us tonight and being so generous with your time and answering questions very thoughtfully and generously. Um, thank you to all of our Q and A and chat moderators tonight. We definitely kept them busy. The chat was scrolling like crazy <laughs> the whole time. Um, thank you so much to Bookstall. And thank you for everyone uh, who participated tonight. Again, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. Um, without you, we wouldn't be here tonight and that would just be really sad. Um, so 
If you would like to purchase Madeline's work, The Song of Achilles and Circe, the link is in the chat and I can put it in once again and that will direct you to the book stall. This event was recorded and will be shared to all registrants. But before we end for the night, Madeline, are there any thoughts that you wanna leave us with? Although that last one was really juicy, I don't know. Well, I think I would just say thank you all so much. I saw all your great, great questions and I just, you know, go libraries. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. Thank you.